Vamos começar? Sim. Teste, teste, teste. Ok, so uh, I think we can start again. Uh, so just to give some context, I think we are a little bit late than, than what I was planned. So I'm, I, I might need to skip uh, some some sessions in the afternoon. Um, but so let's take from the point that we left. So so before we are just talking about initialization uh, and several tweaks. Um, several tricks that uh, are important to make neural networks work in practice. Um, so for those of you working machine translation, this is quite obvious. Uh, if you are working in a machine learning uh, problem, it's useful to split your data into several partitions, one for training, a different one for testing. Uh, it's useful to have one for validation. Uh, and basically the training set is where you're training your model, where you tune the parameters of your model. Uh, <coughs> uh, the validation set is where you tune the hyperparameters, meaning uh, regularization coefficients, learning rates, uh, number of hidden units, how many hidden layers, uh, dropout probability. So there's quite a few uh, hyperparameters uh, in general. And uh, one of the areas that is getting more and more important is how, we, how can you effectively search uh, in this large hyperparameter space. Uh, and finally, the test set is something that we should not touch until the last minute, and you use it to estimate uh, your generalization performance, uh, like how well is you, your uh, model going to work on data that he has never seen. Uh, so let's talk a little bit, a bit about uh, hyperparameter tuning. Uh, so the goal here is to search for the best uh, configuration of hyperparameters. The, the standard approach is to do grid search, so basically, we uh, you know, take all our hyperparameters, specify a range of values, uh, and uh, just you know, define a, a grid, and then try all possible configurations of these values. This is also very expensive, because uh, <coughs> uh, it's, it's going to take a time uh, exponential on the number of hyperparameters that you need to tune. Uh, so an alternative uh, is to do random search, uh, where um, you basically start by specifying a distribution over the values of each hyperparameter. For example, this learning rate uh, as, uh, is uniform between uh, 0.001 and 0 0.1, and then uh, so uh, have a, a random variable that, that, that we uh, sample uh, randomly and to try these values uh, until we explore enough of the, of the search space. Um, another technique that is getting prominence, or another class of techniques, is to use Bayesian optimization and learning to learn techniques to kind of uh, optim put the optimization also in the choose of the, on the choice of the hyperparameters. Uh, so you get two layers of optimization in a way: one to fit the network, neural network parameters to the data, and another one that tries to optimize over the hyperparameters. So I think we are still giving the first steps in, in the, this third class of, of, uh, of techniques. Uh, so in general, we can always go back and fine tune uh, if, if we need to have a, a finer grids uh, or uh, different distributions for the hyperparameters. <coughs> so a, a, an important trick uh, that everyone uses when training neural networks is to do early stopping because it's very rarely the case uh, that uh, your uh, uh, that that you that you that you achieve convergence on your training objective. So typically, what is done is uh, you run several passes over the data, several epochs. So we call epoch a full pass over the data, uh, and we stop training uh, when the validation error increases. Uh, or you know, sometimes what is typically done with with stochastic gradient descent is to, keep, uh, to start with a fixed learning rate, uh, keep uh, looking after each epoch, what's the performance on a validation set. As the performance gets worse, uh, then uh, halve the learning rate, because it may happen that we are just, uh, <coughs> that we are just uh, uh, you know, uh, jumping to a, uh, uh, because of the non-convexity, we are uh, you know, jumping to a bad uh, region of the, uh, of the search space. So, so this is typically done in SUD, 
and typically we also specify a maximum number of epochs uh, that we can afford before stopping the training. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about some tweaks of the trade that are uh, important if you want to play with these things. Uh, so the first one is normalizing the data. Uh, this doesn't make sense for all kinds of data, but for some, if you have uh, continuous uh, inputs, uh, it usually helps a lot. So the idea here is for each input dimension to subtract uh, uh, by the, the mean in the training set and uh, divide by the standard deviation. So this makes sure that you get uh, data with zero mean unit variance. Uh, so typically you need to store the mean and the standard deviation uh, computed in the training set because you need later to use that uh, at runtime as well to um, you know, process the test data the same way. Uh, so um, so this, this usually can speed up training. You don't it, it allows you to reduce the number of epochs. Uh, but if you have uh, sparse inputs, for example, if you are work with working with, with text, with features that are uh, in a large, uh, in a high dimensional space, but very sparse, it doesn't make much sense to do this because it can destroy the sparsity, which is something that we don't want. Uh, so <coughs> the other tweak is to decay the learning rates. <coughs> so this is what the thing that I was mentioning in the other slide. Uh, so if we, if we have a too large a learning rate in stochastic gradient descent, we may end up diverging because you can jump too fast. Uh, you can up, up, uh, be very aggressive updating the, the, the weights. Uh, so it's a good idea when you get closer to the local minima, start the decreasing uh, the step size. So a popular technique that, that works in practice is to start with a, with a, a large learning rate then keep it fi fixed uh, until, uh, uh, as long as the validation error keeps improving. Uh, and if it stops improving, then uh, divide the step size by two and keep going. So an important thing in practice, uh, especially if you are dealing with large data sets, uh, is to use mini batches. So basically, my, when I uh, talked about stochastic gradient descent, I, uh, I stated that uh, it works, uh, so you do updates after seeing a single example. So in practice, uh, it's, it's more effective to not to do this for single examples, but for mini batches of examples, like a small uh, number of examples. For example, we can pick uh, 50, something between 50 and 200 examples, uh, compute the average gradient for all those examples, and then do your uh, stochastic gradient steps on that mini batch. Uh, so this is less noisy than vanilla, stoc vanilla stochastic gradient descent, basically because the, the, the estimate of the gradient is less noisy than, um, than in, in if you just use a single example. Uh, another reason to do this, and maybe this is the main reason, is that uh, if you do this, we can leverage matrix-matrix computations. Uh, so recall that to do the forward propagation uh, in neural networks, uh, at each layer, you need to multiply uh, your weight matrix by, uh, by a vector that is uh, basically describing the inputs uh, on, that layer, la on that layer. So you need to do like uh, H equals WX times uh, plus B. Uh, so, but this is just for a single example. Like if you have several input vectors, uh, all the vectors in your mini batch, then you can do uh, a, a, a matrix matrix multiplication to get uh, another matrix, which is the activations of the Eden units for the several examples. So this is doing these computations uh, in parallel. Uh, and uh, it's particularly important if we are, uh, if, you, if you have the, the chance of using a, 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 graphical, a graphical processing unit, a GPU, to do your computation because the, this is trivially uh, parallelizable. So you can really get huge gains by using mini batches and training on the GPU. Uh, in particular, a good rule of thumb to choose your batch size is to choose it so that we exhaust the GPU as much as possible. Uh, so that you can you know, exp explore mo uh, exploit more of the memory that fits uh, in the GPU. Yeah. So what, what is the impact of uh, the, the error of the size of the batch size? In terms of the optimization error? Yeah. <coughs> uh, so, um, 
it, it might have an impact in terms of the, how fast you converge. Uh, but you can still regard your uh, loss expectation in your mini batch to be an unbiased estimate of your gradient for the full loss, as we did for the single example. Uh, so asymptotically, both, um, both uh, you know, converge at the same rate. Uh, in practice, you do less update, you do fewer updates. So maybe it slows down a little bit, but uh, it's not a, a big difference in practice. So in my experience, it's usually better to try to fit as many things as you can in your mini batch if you have resources for that. <coughs> so uh, if you run, uh, it, it should not affect the performance of your model because you are optimizing the same thing. Uh, it might require that you need, that you run more iterations of, more epochs of training uh, if you use mini batches than if you do SGD updates on a single example. But the final result should be similar in the sense that they are both going to converge to some local minima. Okay. Uh, <coughs> so the other uh, uh <coughs> interesting thing is to use adaptive learning rates. So so far I talked about stochastic gradient descent. Um, it's you know one the simplest uh, algorithm that you can use to train neural networks. But there are um, and somewhat recently people have been working in in better methods that converge faster than SGD. In particular, the idea of doing uh, adaptive gradients, meaning that instead of having a fixed step size for all the parameters, you try to have a, a, to specialize your step size for, uh, for the different dimensions of your weights, uh, is quite beneficial. So in the case of Adagrad, uh, the idea is to scale the learning rates by the square root of the uh, So, yeah. Ah, okay. That's right. Ah, okay. I was looking at the other. <laughs> I was looking at the the button on the other side. <laughs> so, uh, so in case of of uh, Adagrad, uh, what you do is to keep track of the squared, um, like the, uh, okay, so there is a norm sign missing here. This would be the norm of the gradient. So you keep track of the, um, of the sum of the squared norms uh, of the gradient for that parameter. Um, and, um, no, okay, so this is fine. The only thing that is missing, it, there, sh there should be a coordinate here. So basically, you, you update less often uh, weights that, uh, that have uh, larger magnitudes in the gradients. Uh, so we do this by having a different uh, step size uh, for each feature. And yeah, this is not very clear from this picture. So this data here is a single parameter. Uh, and you divide by the square root of the cumulative sum of the norms. This usually works quite well in practice. There are other uh, schedules. Uh, there's another uh, technique called uh, RMS prop, where instead of doing the cumulative sum of the norms, we use uh, uh, an exponential moving average. And more recently, this is one that I have tried and a lot of people are using Adam these days. Uh, basically, it means combining this idea with using momentum for your gradients. And this, in <coughs> this works very well in practice. So typically, you can get, you can get faster convergence by using any of these methods uh, compared with just using stochastic gradient descent. So, okay, another thing that is quite important in practice uh, is to debug your gradients. So uh, it, it, it's common, like uh, if you are starting to work on a new problem to implement your neural network, uh, everything is done, then you start running it and you observe that the training loss is not decreasing. Uh, well, this is terrible because uh, you should at least be able to overfit in your training data. Um, so if the training loss is not decreasing, uh, there might be several reasons for that. One common reason is a bug in the gradient computation. Um, so in linear models, this is not that important because the gradient is simple. You don't have a lot of layers. But in, in neural networks, this is something that uh, becomes you know, uh, often important to debug. So 
to be able to do this, you need to go to every implementation of fprop and, and backprop in each of the modules, in each, of the, uh, in each box in the computation graph, and making sure that uh, your gradient is correct. To do that, we can estimate the numeric gradient, which is basically uh, using a, a finite difference approximation, and compare that with the, with the gradient that you are computing. So this means that you need to perturb uh, your inputs a little bit, um, so to estimate the derivative with a small epsilon, and this number should be close to the number uh, that the bprop uh, computes for for your box in the computation graph. Um, so this is one of those things that are uh, annoying to implement, but often you know speed up the process of debugging things. Of course, if you are using uh, packages that support automatic differentiation, you might never need to do this. But uh, if you if you have a, a something like a new activation function or a, a new operation in the computation graph, you might uh, you make sure making make sure that your computation of the bprop method is correct. Uh, so debugging on a small data set is also something that helps. So if you still have the same situation, so if you if your training loss is still increasing. Uh, and you already debugged your gradients, then a good, a, a good thing to do is to extract a small subset of your training set, something like 50 examples, uh, and monitor the training loss in this set uh, without any regularization. So basically, you should be able to overfit in a small training set like this. If you don't, if you don't overfit, then something must be wrong. Uh, so what could happen is Maybe some units are saturated from the very first iterations. Maybe you are using too much variance to initialize your parameters. Um, so if you are, you just need to reduce it. Or maybe you just need to normalize your inputs if they are continuous. Um, another thing that can happen is your training error bouncing up and down. This typically means that your learning rate is too high. Uh, so just try to decrease uh, the learning rate to a value as small as possible so that you observe an improvement in the training loss. So again, if, if you do everything, every, every of these, uh, like if you have a very small learning rate and your error is still bossing up and down or if the training loss is not going down, then something must be wrong with your gradient. That's, that's usually the cause. Okay, so let's move on to representation learning. Uh, <clears throat> so this is one of the greatest features of neural networks their ability to learn representations. Um, so here's a roadmap for, for this uh, section. We're going to, to talk about uh, this idea of hierarchical compositionality. Uh, then we are going to, to talk about distributed representations, which is a very fundamental idea in neural networks. Uh, we talk uh, about uh, unsupervised pre-training, uh, autoencoders, and finally, uh, a little bit about word embeddings. So the idea of hierarchical compositionality is uh, that we can uh, represent uh, our data by you know, using a course to find representations. For example, in vision, typically we start with some image, which is formed by pixels. From there, we start looking at where the edges are, and then you go uh, you know, from a, a more uh, finer and finer representation until you reach uh, objects, and finally you have a scene that you can uh, try to understand. Uh, in speech, your raw data is audio sample. Uh, then you form different representations, uh, you know, spectral representation, and so on, to the level of phones, and then from phones, phones to words, eventually from words to sentences, and so on. Uh, in text, we have something similar, but with characters, right? We start with characters, then we form words. We use the words to form a phrase, then a sentence, then a story, and maybe something else. Uh, and so this is something that arises in a lot of uh, uh, problems for different kinds of data. Uh, so, uh, so to give an idea about uh, how this happens in practice, uh, how, how this is represented in neural networks, is an example uh, extracted from uh, uh, a convolutional neural network that I'm going to talk about uh, in, in, the, in the next section, uh, trained on the image net data sets. Uh, where each of these uh, boxes is uh, basically a hidden layer in the neural network. So this is a very deep, you know, uh, somewhat deep neural network with four layers in this case. 
And uh, what these boxes are representing is uh, what the, 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 the activation functions uh, of each neuron as a function of the, the pixels, the inputs, which are the pixels in the image. So we can see that the, low, the, the first hidden layers, the ones that are closest to, to the inputs, are representing very basic things like edges, colors, a little bit of texture, and so on. Uh, if you go to the next layer, then we're starting to see some shapes, circles, some weird texture here. Uh, yeah, some, you know, these, these are clearly more fine, gr fine um, grained representations than these ones. And if you go to, the, to another layer, then you start to see sometimes complete objects or complete parts of an object. Uh, so this is what typically arises internally in the representations that are learned uh, in neural networks. And there is some biological evidence that uh, the visual cortex, uh, cortex in the brain kind of does something similar to this. So uh, we start capturing uh, images in our retina, then uh, we, there's some part of the brain that detects simple visual forms, like edges and corners. Uh, then we start grouping them, uh, forming intermediate visual forms. Uh, then we get high level object descriptions, face, you recognize faces, objects, and so on. <laughs> Uh, you map that to another region of the brain that uh, allows us to do categorical judgments, to, to make decisions and so on. And that is eventually mapped to motor commands, uh, you know, to our uh, finger muscle to do something with, with your hands. Um, so this is, uh, you know, the kind of uh, intuition that uh, is motivated by, by this um, biological uh, evidence. So uh, one important idea, uh, apart from uh, hierarchical compositionality, is the idea of distributed representations. So this, this has been you know, one of the fundamental ideas brought by uh, Jeff Hinton in the 80s. Uh, and so just to give a flavor about what this means, let's suppose that we are uh, training a neural network to recognize patterns that look uh, something like this. So our objects uh, sometimes are rectangles. They can be vertical rectangles, horizontal rectangles, vertical ellipses, horizontal ellipses, and so on. And let's suppose that uh, we have some units uh, that uh, fire when some of, the, some of these uh, objects are presented as inputs. So in the, in the case in the left, uh, we have kind of uh, what is called a one-hot representation of your inputs, meaning that each hidden unit is exclu exclusively representing a type of object. So for example, this one, it only fires if it sees a vertical uh, rectangle. This one only fires if it sees a horizontal rectangle. And the same thing here for ellipses. Uh, so let's compare the, that's one hot representation with, uh, with, the with what is called a distributed representation that works like this. So here there is one unit that detects that something is vertical and another unit that detects that the shape is a rectangle. Uh, here we have uh, one unit that detects that the, the, the shape is horizontal uh, and it's a rectangle. And, it's, and the same thing for, for the ellipses. So this is what is called a distributed representation as opposed to a one-hot representation. Uh, so the key idea in distributed representations is that no single neuron encodes everything. Uh, instead of having a neuron encoding the entire object, we have properties of the object and each neuron is trying to represent one or a small number of properties of that object. So that the neurons need to work together to represent something. So this is why they are called distributed. Uh, and so to see why this can be important, let's suppose now that, uh, <coughs> that we have a circle, that we present a, a circle as an input, uh, which is neither an ellipse, neither a rectangle, it's, neither, uh, it's probably closer to an ellipse, but it's not vertical or horizontal, it's some, something in the middle. If you try to represent this with a local distribution, with a one-hot uh, representation, um, there's no way you can do that because each of these neurons is only representing a particular type of object. So for example, this representation is weird. You're saying that this is a vertical rectangle plus a horizontal rectangle plus a horizontal ellipsis. Doesn't make any sense. But uh, with a distributed representation, you can do this. So this is stating that it's something vertical, but it's also horizontal and it looks like an ellipse. So it's the natural object that fits this is a circle, even though you, know, you never saw a circle before. Um, okay, so before I proceed, is there any, anything that you want to ask? <coughs> okay. Yeah. 
That's a good question. So this is something that the, net, the neural network, as I described, is already doing in, in its uh, intermediate representations. Because if you look at uh, each neuron, each hidden unit in, the, in, the, in a hidden layer, they are uh, both functions of uh, everything in the, in, the, in the object. And when you train them to maximize, <laughs> if you train them to minimize some loss function, uh, then it's probably going to converge to something that looks like a distributed representation. Uh, so, for example, going back to the to these examples, all these can be regarded as distributed representations uh, of the objects in your inputs, right? There is one that is representing vertical edge, another one that is representing uh, uh, horizontal edge, and so on. So they are they are all complementary in some way. Uh, and the reason why these distribution representations arise is that we have several hidden units in each layer, so each of them can specialize to a particular property. This is also why it's important to break the symmetry when training neural networks. So if you initialize all the weights the same way for all the hidden units, there's no way they can become specialized on different properties from each other. Any further questions? So it's, it's actually, usually it's the opposite. Uh, you have many more different objects than properties that you want to enumerate for those objects. So here it's, it happens to be the same number, like you have four objects and four properties. But now suppose that you have, you know, uh, so if you had circle here, you already have five uh, one-hot representations in this case, but here you can still have four. Uh, so for example, if the network is recognizing faces, the, instead of recognizing each individual face, uh, maybe it's a good idea to recognize uh, you know, some features of, of faces. That's the idea. So typically distributed representations can also more compactly represent objects. Yes? How do we enforce the network property one time? Uh, so that usually happens naturally. Uh, if you do a random initialization of the weights, uh, each hidden unit is automatically getting something. Um, yeah. So, so one one thing that is important to note is that if you take a multi if you take a multi-layer neural network uh, or a single layer, so just to be a single hidden layer, and you permute all the hidden units, uh, you can still permute the weight vector after that and have a model that is exactly the same. So it doesn't matter which hidden unit, uh, the order of the hidden units is not important. Uh, but it's important that they are as complementary as possible. So, so the, okay, so if you, if you think about the loss function that you're optimizing, it's probably because if you fix the number of hidden units, it's uh, cheaper to achieve a configuration in which each hidden unit is representing, representing a different property than one configuration not where each uh, hidden unit is over-specialized on the inputs that you are presenting. So for example, if you have a data set with a thousand uh, examples and you just have 10 uh, hidden units in your hidden layer, you need to represent a thousand things just with 10 numbers, or, right? So it, uh, it's impossible to converge to a one-hot representation unless you skip some of the things that you're trying to represent. But if you do it with properties and if you can describe uh, a thousand individuals by naming 10 properties, like uh, the color of the eyes, the color of the air, how many, how many hands, <laughs> things like that, then maybe you can do it with just with 10 even units. Does that make sense? Okay, so, okay, let's talk about unsupervised pre-training. 
Um, this used to be a very popular thing six years ago. Um, so basically, it's so one of the reasons why neural networks uh, were not very used until the last uh, five years is that it was regarded as very challenging to train them, uh, especially if you have uh, you know many many hidden layers, so very deep neural networks. Um, so th this is why the, you know many people abandoned neural networks for a while. Um, so one uh, solution that uh, solved that problem is to um, to do hidden uh, to do layer-wise training. So basically, the idea is to initialize uh, every hidden layer by doing unsupervised learning and do this layer by layer. Uh, so the idea is that we can force the network to try to represent latent structure of the input uh, distribution. For example, if you are trying to recognize characters, then maybe the network should not waste you know, uh, too much effort trying to represent random images like that. So maybe if you can learn a, a lower dimensional manifold uh, that can contain all possible characters or where it fits well to, to the, our space of characters, it's probably a good idea to uh, you know, make sure that the hidden layer is representing that well. So, when, when, uh, uh, so there are several examples of uh, unsupervised networks that uh, fit well into this strategy of training things uh, layer by layer, uh, like autoencoders, restricted Boltzmann machines. I was planning to talk about uh, RBMs later, but probably I don't have time. But uh, here I'm going to talk about autoencoders, which is a very simple idea. And now we can do this unsupervised training by using autoencoders. So what is an autoencoder? Uh, it's basically just a fit for a neural network that is trained to reproduce the input at the output layer. So this means that uh, we, we feed an input to the neural network, we expect to get a hidden representation, h of x, and then we try to reconstruct our input uh, in the output as uh, x at. And uh, the parameters, we have uh, a matrix of parameters w in the, uh, uh, after the input layer, and then you just have the transposed parameters on the output. So to, this is important to make sure that the two parameters are tied to each other. Uh, so basically, if you write that as, as equations, you get something like that. Uh, the encoder has this expression, which is a, a nonlinear function applied to an affine, an affine transformation of your inputs. Uh, and then you have a decoder that is applying the transpose of that weight matrix uh, to the hidden representation and tries to recover, to reconstruct uh, x uh, in, in the output. And the last function, uh, if you are assuming that our inputs are real valued, uh, if they are discrete, there are other loss functions that make sense here, it can be just a, a simple uh, uh, squared Euclidean distance. So this generalizes PCA. So if you are familiar with PCA, uh, <coughs> so PCA is used to uh, compute a, a low dimensional representation of your data, and it corresponds to basically having a linear activation in the hidden layer. So if you have, if everything is linear here, then and assuming that the number of hidden units is smaller than the number of input units, this will give you uh, essentially PCA. Uh, so the, the novelty here is that you can use any activation uh, and there are several kinds of autoencoders that depend on uh, architectural things, but also what kind of activation is being used. Sure, yeah, the, you, you can do that. Typically, you need, so this is used in a, uh, so I'm, I'm introducing autoencoders here as a way of doing layer-wise training of a larger neural network. So you still have that hyperparameter left. You still need to find out how many hidden units are going to use. So yes. I, I would not do that inside the autoencoder because of course, if you have more hidden units, then you can reconstruct better your inputs. You need some kind of bottleneck. Uh, but uh, in the end, if you consider the entire uh, network that you are trying to optimize, you still need to consider that hyperparameter.
So yes, the stack doctor encoders is one of the things that is used, which is essentially what you're saying. Uh, in yeah, in parallel, I don't know much work who has done that in parallel. Maybe there is. Uh, yeah, it looks uh, an interesting idea. Um, so that could give you different, uh, you know, levels of representations. So you're talking about parallelizing, but with different uh, hidden sizes. Okay. I think it makes sense. Uh, in the end, you'll get a five-dimensional representation by concatenating the two. I don't know if that would be better than just uh, doing an uh, autoencoder with five hidden units. But uh, yeah, I don't know anyone who has done that. Maybe there is. Any any further questions? Okay. So, oops. So there are several variants of autoencoders that uh, that people uh, have proposed. Uh, sparse autoencoders, uh, they're very very nice. So the idea is instead of doing this bottleneck, uh, you know, having a, a small number of hidden units, <coughs> and to rely on that bottleneck to be able to compress your input data, because this is all about compressing the input data, right? We are trying to find uh, lower dimensional uh, manifolds that can be used to compress uh, your data. And then if you have a good compression, then you should be able to get a good reconstruction in the end. Uh, but so another idea is to have a, a large hidden layer, so many uh, hidden units, uh, and to impose some structure on those hidden units. For example, imposing that they must be, uh, the representation must be sparse. Only a few of the hidden units uh, should, uh, should give non-zeros. Uh, so this is what sparse autoencoders do. Uh, yeah, it's a, I think it's a little bit more complicated than what I'm describing here with the Elmond organization term, but um, you can you can look it up if you are interested in this topic to get a more uh, evolved explanation. So denoising autoencoders uh, are also uh, they have been quite popular. So the idea is to borrow ideas from denoising from image denoising uh, in in autoencoders. So the idea is instead of um, so the idea is basically take a standard autoencoder uh, and to add noise to the input and then to try to reconstruct the output uh, as it is. So the fact that you are injecting noise to the to the input is adding some robustness to the compression algorithm that is producing your lower dimensional representation. So the the injection of noise here uh, aims to get something uh, like a, a more robust representation. Um, that generalizes better to other inputs, um, which is, it happens to be similar to ideas uh, that arise in image denoising. So you get a representation function that is uh, more smooth than if you don't do, if you don't add noise. We also have stacked autoencoders that is just stacking autoencoders on top of each other. And there's also something called variational autoencoders. Uh, I don't think it's going to be more later because I might not reach that point. But the idea is to define a generative uh, uh, neural network uh, that uh, is probabilistic and that minimizes the variational bounds um, on the energy uh, to generate. So this is a, a, an idea that mixes autoencoders with the variational inference. Uh, and it, it's, uh, it gives rise to a network that can generate uh, new images uh, from scratch. OK. so. So in unsupervised pre-training, uh, what is done is very simple. So it's a greedy layer-wise procedure. Suppose that we have, um, um, you have a neural network like that, uh, and you want to train all the, all the so you want to uh, tune, to train all the parameters. Uh, we just start with the, with the bottom layer, uh, the one that connects the inputs to the first hidden layer. Uh, and you just uh, use an autoencoder to try to reconstruct this input uh, by stacking that on top of this. And by doing that, we learn uh, matrix W and you just use that matrix as the weights of this layer. After you are done with that, we move on to the next layer. 
So in the, in the next layer, we are going to use as inputs, not your uh, standard inputs, but the representations learned from the first layer. Because the first layer is giving you uh, h of x, h1 of x. Uh, and you can uh, just use uh, h as the input to the second autoencoder. And by doing that, we learn all the weights in the second layer. And you can do this for every uh, hidden layer that you have until you uh, have uh, obtained weights for the entire neural network. Uh, so this idea worked very well in practice, and I think it was one of the, the, the ideas that boosted uh, you know, research in, in neural networks, because finally, you would be able to train very deep neural networks uh, you know, without, without problems. Um, okay, so typically there is a final step that is necessary if you do this, which is to fine tune the network. So this is used not to train the full network, but just as a method for, for initialization. Uh, so as we have pre-trained all the layers, then you had the output layer, and then you train the whole network using supervised learning, just as usual. But now we know that at least we have a good uh, uh, initialization, so the weights are already in a good region. It doesn't take, it, it's not that hard to fine tune it to get even better. Okay, so now let's move to word representations. I don't know if there, is there any question before I move on to this? Okay, so, <coughs> so word representations or word embeddings or word vectors. Uh, so this, is, this is, has been a very popular idea uh, in text processing uh, where the goal is to go from a combinatorial structure of language where words compose to each other to form sentences to uh, a continuous representation in terms of vectors. So the idea here is to come up with a vector representation of a word. Uh, so the assumption here um, to, that leads us to choose the, the good, uh, you know, the, the, a good vector representation for the words is to rely on something called uh, distributional similarity. This is not the same thing as distributed representations. This is distributional similarity. This comes from linguistics. And the, the fundamental intuition here is that we should represent a word by, uh, by using uh, the context in which that word appears. So there, there's, there's this famous uh, sentence by uh, Firth that says that we, we shall know a word by the company it keeps. This is basically the fundamental idea. We are going to look at the context in which the words occur to be able to better uh, represent that, sent that word. Uh, and this has been very successful in statistical NLP, even before uh, you know, the usage of deep learning techniques, uh, in particular for um, lexical semantics and things like that. So the question is, how can we obtain these vector representations? So classically, the classical methods, what they try to do is to first compute the co-occurrence word context matrix. So they look at a large corpus of text, uh, they start counting how often do this word occurs with this uh, another word in the context. They uh, collect all this information in a very large matrix, a very sparse and large matrix. Uh, and then they, they apply factorization techniques to factorize that matrix uh, using, for example, weighted semantic analysis, uh, which is essentially the similar thing as PCA, uh, to, to obtain a, a vector representation of the words. So this is one possibility. The second method, which is the one that we're going to talk about, uh, is to directly learn the low dimensional vectors by training a neural network uh, to predict the context of a given word. So this is what is implemented in a, in a famous software package called Word2Vec that, uh, that, uh, that became very popular. So this was uh, developed by Mikolov and others uh, in uh, 2013. Uh, following previous ideas from older literature, uh, from Benju, Colbert, and others, uh, but in a method that is so simple and so fast to, to run that got really, really popular. Let's see how, how it works. So there are two variants, uh, variants in Word2Vec. Uh, one, uh, which is going to be the one that we're going to talk about, uh, is Scriptgram, where the idea is uh, trying to predict the context words uh, given uh, the, the word in, in the, so we basically, we look at the window of words in our sentence, we, del we uh, hide the word in the middle, and we try to predict all the words in the context uh, given uh, the word in the middle. Um, actually the other way around, you, you hide all the context, you just observe the word in the middle, and you try to predict the context words given the word in the middle. 
So CBAO does the, the other way around. Uh, it tries to uh, see the context and predict the same. Ah, okay, this is everything uh, flipped. Um, yeah, so here we just see the word in the middle and we predict the context words. In this one, uh, we predict the central word given the context. Um, okay, so the objective function, this can be formalized by uh, optimizing a, a, an objective function, in the case of skipgram, uh, which is basically maximizing the log probability of any context word given the current center word. So here, wt is representing the center words, and wt plus j, where j ra ranges from minus m to m and it's not zero, it's uh, representing uh, any word in the context. So we are trying to maximize this probability uh, and we have a parametric model for this uh, uh, probability distribution. So the way we are going to do that is by defining probability of uh, uh, context word O given uh, central word C to be uh, a softmax on the inner product between um, the vector representation of the context word and the vector representation of the central word. So by doing this process, so we have one parameter uh, u and one parameter v for every uh, word in the corpus. So if you, if you optimize this, uh, we, we, are, we are going to end up with two vector representations for a word. We are going to obtain a vector repre representation as that for that word as the center word and the vector representation of that word as a context word. Um, okay, so this seems to be a reasonable idea, uh, but there is a challenge here, which is you need enough data to, to do this, to get uh, good representations for uh, all the words that we are interested in. Uh, and unfortunately, this step of computing the softmax for all the words in the vocabulary is quite expensive. So if you, you know, see, if, let's suppose that you have a corpus of, uh, let's say, a million words, which is not that large. People do it with billions of words. But let's say a million of words, you can already uh, see if you count how many uh, distinct uh, uh, types, how many distinct words uh, you see in that corpus, it grows to hundreds of thousands. So basically, as you see more and more uh, uh, a larger and larger corpus, uh, the number uh, of, uh, like the vocabulary size is going to increase, increase. So it's typical to have hundreds of thousands or even more. Uh, and so the problem with softmax is that computing these uh, in hundreds of thousands of dimensions is quite expensive. Uh, so it can take like one, two seconds, but if, if you want to do this for every token in your uh, gigantic corpus, this is going to take a long time. So a trick that Mikolov and others uh, used was to negative sampling, uh, where the idea is the following. Uh, so uh, instead of training with the other objective, with this objective, they switch to, to, to this uh, other objective. So they train binary logistic regressions uh, by, doing, by trying to distinguish a true pair, meaning uh, a center word and the, and the uh, correct words in the context window, uh, trying to contrast this true pair with uh, a couple of random pairs, which is basically a center word uh, with a random word as context. So we want the model to give more weight to true pairs than it gives to random pairs. Um, so this means here in this example, so where uh, C is the central word, uh, this is the uh, probability of the two words, the, the true context word, uh, O, conditioned on C, and this, each of these things is the probability of a random word, GI, conditioned on C. And what we want to do is to uh, have high probability here and low probability here. And you just random, randomly sample k random words to, to use as context. So this looks a little bit like a hack, but it, it, it works very well in practice. Um, so let's look at some examples. Um, one of the things that was noticed is that uh, we can actually solve word analogy problems with this simple technique. So uh, if you run these and we obtain uh, word vector representations for the several words, uh, and you, if you now look at the relations between those words, you start realizing that just subtracting uh, these two vectors, uh, apple, uh, the representation of apple minus the representation of apples, which is the plural of apple, is kind of similar to subtracting cars from car and families from family. So we are capturing the plural relation. Uh, semantically, we also get things like these, like 
the difference between shirt and clothing is similar to shirt and furniture, uh, and most famously, is di famously this one. Uh, the difference between king and man is similar to queen and woman, and uh, this might have looked, uh, you know, uh, uh, puzzling at first. But uh, th there is uh, some evidence that this actually uh, arises. So if you if you later, uh, so typically I forgot to mention dimensions here. Typically, when computing word vectors, people use dimensions in the hundreds, like three hundred uh, uh, dimensional uh, vectors, and so on. Uh, so this picture here is showing uh, uh, the two uh, most uh, important dimensions of that 300-dimensional uh, space. So this is just projecting into a into a, a plane. And if you if you project some words there, we actually see patterns like that. So this vector uh, going from brother, brother to sister, nephew and niece, uncle and aunt, they're all very similar to each other. Um, so another example is. Oh, I forgot to mention. So word analogies are those problems where someone tells you, okay, uh, sister is to brother as what is to uncle, and you need to guess what this word is. So if you just use the word representations and you just compute what is the word that is the nearest neighbor uh, of this other word, um, in the, and using the relation between brother and sister, you actually get aunt as the answer. And there are data sets that evaluate these, and these methods got very good scores in those, in those data sets. So another example is other relations like companies to CEOs, uh, and uh, superlatives like slow, slower, slowest, short, shorter, shortest, and so on. Okay, so there was supposed to be a lunch break here, so we are a little bit late. I don't know, in terms of time, what time was it supposed to, to be the coffee break? Uh, in about 15 minutes. 15, okay. Uh, so uh, again, the shameless flex. Okay, so let's try to use these 15 minutes to get started in convolutional neural networks. Uh, so let's try to see where we are and what you can do. So we, we might need to reduce this to half. So we can choose, uh, maybe you, you have some preferences. So I can talk about convolutional nets, recurrent neural networks, sequence to sequence and beyond. These two are very related to each other. Uh, there's also a few slides in generative models, but this is a good candidate to skip, unless you really want to see this covered. Is there any preference? Okay, so I'm just going in the usual order and, and let's see what happens. So convolutional neural networks are going to be relevant for people that work in computer vision and image processing, uh, because that's where convolutional neural networks uh, got most popular. So the idea of convolutional neural networks is very simple. They are just neural networks with some specialized connectivity structure. Uh, so this is the roadmap uh, for this section. Uh, so this is just you know, a recap of, of what a convolution is. Convolution between uh, function x and the filter w. Uh, it's basically taking uh, you know, the, the, the value of the function in the point uh, a, uh, applying the filter, uh, and you get something in, in well, you get the convoluted function in the end. So typically this filter is something uh, uh, sparse, something that works in a small window, uh, so a limited interval in time. Uh, and when you apply that, this becomes a combination of points that are nearby t. Okay? So this is going to become more clear with this image. So here, um, this is comparing basically what you get with a dense layer something that will arise in a, in a multi-layer neural network as we have described. So connecting four inputs to four hidden units, you get 16 parameters, right? Excluding the biases. Uh, and this is what we can do with the convolutional layer. So here, first we have sparse connectivity. So this uh, hidden unit is only receiving weights from a window of size three. So it's, it's not receiving anything from this one. It's only looking at uh, this context of size three. Uh, the same thing for the other units. And the second fundamental idea is parameter uh, sharing. So uh, these uh, three parameters are shared for all, <coughs> for all uh, uh, units here. So they all use the same weight representation. So there are, there are only three parameters in this layer. Uh, so the reason to do this is to try to achieve uh, translation equivariance. Basically trying to make your network behave the same way uh, here, 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 and there. So 
Uh, this is good if you want to capture uh, some patterns in your data that for which it doesn't matter uh, where they are uh, spatially. So in images, if you want to, um <coughs> if you want to detect a face, maybe you don't care about the face being in the upper left corner or the bottom right corner and so on. Um, maybe the face example is not a very good one, but there are cases of recognizing objects in images that, that are like this. Uh, <coughs> so if you tie parameters, uh, we immediately reduce the number of parameters to be learned, which is a very good thing. Uh, so if, you, if these vectors are very large, then the number of parameters is going quadrat quadratically, and uh, you need more data to learn those parameters correctly. The second reason is that it allows us to deal with arbitrary long variable length sequences. So this is going to be important in text, for example, where we are building uh, convolutional neural networks for sentences, and sentences can have arbitrary length. So another important operation that is used in convolutional neural networks are pooling operations. Uh, <coughs> so mo most prominently max pooling, which got uh, very popular in, in uh, convolutional neural networks. So the idea here is that um, we aggregate to achieve local invariance. So for example, this uh, unit here is looking at uh, these three inputs. <coughs> So the activations here are 0 0.1, 1, and 0 0.2, and just, just takes the max of this tree. And here we do the same, we just take the max of this tree uh, and just put the max here, okay? Uh, so by doing that, uh, we kind of get a little bit more insensitive to translation in the sense that, uh, so this is not uh, uh, equivariance in translation, this is invariance in translation, which is different. Uh, so if you shift uh, these uh, to the right, um, then we get s some, a similar representation. In this case, it's probably not obvious, but like these two ones are still here. So this is not exactly invariant, but uh, it promotes being more invariant because you just uh, pick the most prominent feature uh, from the layers above, regardless of where that prominent feature is. Uh, so in practice, what is done is not these, but these. So we don't have... Uh, the same number of uh, pooling units uh, in the output, but you just pull. So you have one unit that pulls these, these three things, then another one that pulls these three, and so on, without overlaps. So this, okay, the second thing, uh, still related to filters and convolutions, is to use multiple filters. Uh, in images, this is very important. So we just don't want just a single filter, but you want different filters that capture, uh, capture different things. And Again, I'm, I'm not an expert in, Im in image processing and computer vision, but uh, I, so I think that people have been uh, uh, you know, working very hard doing uh, uh, engineering to come up with good filters by hand, uh, filters that try to capture the intended thing that we want to have in a target. Uh, so doing that with neural networks just does that representation learning automatically instead of having to manually specify the filters. Um, so, this works if you allow for multiple filters to, cap to capture different properties. So an example where this was first used, uh, so using older ideas of new Cognitron uh, in, the, in 1980, uh, is uh, this association of a convolutional net in 89 by Le Kuhn, uh, where so this was done to recognize uh, digits, uh, and it was you know, quite accurate uh, at the time. Uh, and this is just alternating between convolutions uh, <coughs> uh, and pooling layers. Uh, and you just stack these layers on, to on top of each other. Uh, so there's been quite a few uh, successes uh, with ConvNets. Uh, so for example, the state of the art right now in MNIST, which is the data set of uh, digits. This is a very famous benchmark that people use to compare different machine learning algorithms. Uh, so the latest I saw, the, the error was 0.35%. Uh, I don't know if this is still updated. Uh, performance for recognizing uh, Arabic and Chinese characters is also uh, improving quite a lot with ConvNets. Uh, we got some, some very interesting results. For example, to recognize traffic signs, we achieve uh, superhuman performance. Uh, so if, if you have like a blurred images of traffic signs, uh, apparently machines are better than humans now. Um, 
and the error is really low. Uh, and there are other benchmark data sets with images for which uh, we got good results at recognizing objects. Uh, less so if you are using complex data sets uh, and you don't have enough training examples. So one crucial thing to have these good results is to have enough data to train neural networks. Because neural networks have a very uh, um, big capacity, but you need enough data to you know, exploit uh, all these uh, good aspects of, of neural networks. So another popular data set uh, that was introduced more recently is the ImageNet. Uh, which, co which contains uh, 14 million level images and 4,000 different classes, uh, you know, very fine-grained object, object descriptions. Uh, the images were gathered from the internet and the labels were obtained with Mechanical Turk. Um, so these are some image examples. Uh, and there is a very famous uh, neural network that was introduced in 2012 uh, by Alex Krzyzewski and other people from Toronto. Uh, where it's a very large-scale network for the time. They, it has like f uh, 54 million parameters with eight layers, a uh, total of five convolutional layers and three fully connected layers. Uh, it was trained on these million of images. You can uh, think about, oh, this might, might have taken uh, you know, too much time to train. In fact, it was trained on a week, so it's a little bit, on GPUs, so two GPUs for a week. This is, I think, the earliest work that started using GPUs to train neural networks. So in this particular case, uh, Alex uh, Krzyzewski uh, really knew how to implement NVIDIA kernels and he did you know, a lot of the work himself. Uh, so uh, by using GPUs, uh, they managed to parallelize the training uh, of the neural networks using mini batches and so on. They also used dropout regularization. Uh, dropout was introduced about the same time. Uh, and by doing that, they got a test error of 16.4, which was quite good for this data set. So the second best team was much further away. Uh, <coughs> so after that, uh, Google, uh, as usual, decided to mm, do the same thing in-house with a larger set of images and a larger network. So this is a much deeper network. Uh, I don't know how many layers it has, but it alternates between convolution, pooling layers, softmax and other. I don't know what the others are. Uh, this is called uh, Google Net, uh, and uh, the, the uh, interesting thing here is that it actually has fewer parameters than the previous one. So the other one had 54 million, this has only 5 million, so it's about 10 times less. And the trick is to uh, have, um, to have a, a, deeper, a deeper network uh, that requires fewer, fewer uh, units uh, to achieve the same uh, expressive uh, power. Yes? Uh, no, <laughs> I cannot even read what's written here. Uh, I, I, I might suspect that they are doing something similar to layer-wise training, but instead of being layer by layer, they train this piece before plugging something else and, and so on. But I'm not completely sure about this. Yes? I think it's basically human processing. So they, they got a lot of Google engineers uh, trying different things and convert. I don't think that there's a, I mean, the only rationale is in uh, alternating convolution layers with pooling layers and so on. But apart from that, I don't think that there's nothing that explains why this is asymmetric or. Uh, well, for that, well, okay, so these ones I don't know how to explain. Uh, but like blue ones after, uh, red ones after blue ones, they kind of make sense. This is applying a pooling operation after a convolution. And this has been done by early work of Yan Kuhn <coughs> and others. Uh, the idea is that you first apply a convolution to get a, 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 filter, um, a, conv a filter convolution in your input images. And then you do pooling to get a translation uh, invariance. The two things go well together. I think you need to engineer again. Uh, some of the, the intuitions are still the same. You, you might still need something that looks vaguely like, like well, not these, but maybe like this. This is your, uh, you know, 
uh, the place where you start from. And from that, you just uh, include more layers in some parts and so on. But uh, probably you need to do more engineering if you have a different problem. Yeah. A at some point, this, this all becomes engineering problems. Um, just trying what works, using some intuitions if you can. But there's not much more than that. Is what? <laughs> Trial and error. Uh, yeah, and uh, and uh, hyperparameter tuning. So there is no background theory derived from Java. No what? There is no background theory derived from Java. I I, don't, I mean I never worked in these problems myself, so I might not be the right person to answer. But my intuition here is that this basically lies on intuitions, like uh, what convolutions are doing, what pooling layers are doing. Uh, maybe if you are an expert and you, if you have worked on image processing before, you already know what kind of patterns you are willing to represent. But that's about it. I don't think there's more than that. But how do you know, for example, when you say that in the middle of the machine layers that they are able to do them in the visual representation, how do you know what, what is the process of choosing? Because you look at the parameter type of lots of parameters and see if there is some pattern? Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, visualization of neural networks that is going to show some things. I don't know if they completely answer that question. Um, so of course you can you can uh, uh, debug your neural network. You can look at what are the activations. Uh, uh, so what neurons are, are are firing if you present them some input, and maybe you can do some analysis on that. So that's also part of the engineering, I would say. Oh, so we still, we st uh, this one, I think. I don't know what these ones are doing. I, I really don't know. So I, my guess is that they might have been optimizing this first, and then they added these and then that, but I'm not completely sure if this is true. But uh, in the end, yeah, in this problem, it makes sense to have just a single output. Usually that's what happens, yes. So the, the last layers are providing more fine-grained representations. Um, well, not sure about averages, but yeah, they are combining things that come from previous layers. But I, I, so maybe I'm wrong, but it could happen that, so ImageNet uh, has different uh, prediction tasks. You, one is recognizing objects, but there are also that you sometimes you just want to localize the object. Other times you want to, to say that uh, uh, the image uh, contains some object, but you don't want to localize. So maybe some outputs are doing other tasks. It could be something like that. Um, also, so one thing that really works well with neural networks is multitask learning. So if you share parts of the network to, to, to the, of the network to do a different but related task, uh, it typically helps you. Uh, so maybe that's what's going on here. I, I need to look at this further. Any, any more questions? OK, so, so let's see how this can be used in NLP as well. Uh, so in, NL, in NLP, what we do is to use 1D convolutions, not 2D. Um, so the filters are applied to local windows around each word. Um, so is, if you start with a sentence like this, uh, we then apply uh, you know, different filters around this word um, and so on. Uh, so f if you start with word embeddings, uh, x1 to xl, so the word vectors that I show in the previous session, then if the filter response for a word is just concatenating uh, all the word embeddings uh, on a window uh, of size uh, 2 times h plus 1, uh, applying, uh, multiplying that by, by the weights, uh, adding a bias, getting the neural activation, and the uh, hi is going to be the response uh, for that word. Um, so if sometimes we pad left and right with special symbols, uh, this happens if you apply different convolutions and you want to keep the size of the sentence representation <coughs> fixed. <coughs> Uh, 
so suppose that we have a very long sentence with a fixed expression. Like for example, here the sentence is the cat. Well, I cannot read this. Like let's suppose that it's the white cat. Okay. So you can say the white cat is chasing the blue dog, or you can say I really like this white cat. In both cases, white cat is denoting the same thing. It doesn't matter if it's the subject of the sentence or if uh, it appears somewhere else in the sentence. And you still want to have a representation of just that phrase, uh, white cat. So this is an example. It's like recognizing a face in the image. It doesn't matter if the face is here or there. It matters that it's there. So then later, if depending on what is the final task, you might want to look at where the cat is in the image or, or in the sentence. Uh, but uh, for the sake of representing it, it's, it's not relevant, or the assumption is that it is irrelevant if the white cat is in the beginning of the sentence or the end of the sentence. Uh, so I don't know if it's significant, but isn't that uh, error prone in some, in some words? Because some words have the same, the same word can be the noun or verb. Yeah, sure. That, that can happen, but uh, so this usually helps to disambiguate the words because uh, let's uh, so the cat is a good example. Let's say that uh, I'm I'm running the so cat is also a Unix command, right? So you can say I'm I'm getting file A and file B. Uh, John cat A with B. Uh, this in this uh, usage cat will be a verb, right? Uh, but by looking at the context, John cat is probably not going uh, giving a similar representation as white cat, right? So having these phrase representations helps us uh, actually disambiguating what the words mean in their context. So this is an orthogonal question to the translation invariant. Okay, so, so again, okay, mini-batching, uh, as I uh, said before, it's uh, typically necessary to speed up training. This was very important for the ImageNet example, the Kuch uh, Alex Kuchevsky paper, uh, especially if you have GPUs and you can use them. Um, but how to cope with different input sizes? So in NLP, sentences have different lengths. So we don't want a model that just works on sentences of size 20, but if I show a sentence of size 15, it doesn't work, it breaks. Uh, so we need uh, something that, uh, that works with that. So convolutional neural networks, are, uh, they can be used regardless of the length of the sentence, but to train, if you do mini-batching, uh, we still need to group sentences into batches to do parallel computation, right? So you want to apply all these filters at the same time for the different sentences, then these filters at the same time, and so on. Uh, and to do that, we could just uh, you know, form batches uh, by the order that we see the sentences. That will be something like this. And then padding, so uh, adding some extra symbols uh, if, if when you go past this, the length of the sentence. But that will be quite inefficient because there's a lot of padding here. So in this case, the largest sentence, sentence three, is very large, and this is forcing us to pad all the other sentences. So typically what is done is to first sort the data set by sentence length, and then form mini batches according to the length of the sentences. We still need to do some padding, but it's much less padding than if you did this. So this is something annoying that people need to do in practice. For convolution, that's not the main reason. The, that helps, but uh, so the two reasons are the better generalization because you have fewer parameters, and uh, so actually three reasons. The third one is uh, translation equivariance, and the, the third is the ability to cope with different sentence lengths. Yeah, it depends on what you want. If you, if you don't want translation equivariance, uh, or if you want to break it for some reason, then it's a good idea to do something like that. You can regard that as another initialization method, because then you fine-tune the, the dense network. Uh, but if you do want to preserve uh, translation equivariance, maybe you don't want that. I don't know. Um, but it could be a good idea in some problems, yes. 
So we need to do a break. I think I'm actually finishing this part. Okay, so maybe can can I just go one minute? Yeah, sure. Because this will end this section and it. Uh, okay, so the um, so there's this question of what kind of re representations we are learning. So which neurons fire for recognizing a particular object? Uh, to understand that, we need to visualize what's going on inside the neural network. Uh, and one, there is a very simple idea that people have tried, um, I think there are probably others, uh, which is just to uh, uh, fix the output. Like for example, in this example, we start with uh, providing random input. Uh, the network makes some prediction, it doesn't matter what prediction it is. But you just say that, no, I want this to be a banana, okay? So I want the object to be recognized to be a banana. This is one of the classes that we want to predict. And then uh, we, uh, you, you do gradient back propagation to uh, tune all the weights in the network, including the input nodes in the computation graph, to make the output uh, overfit the class banana. And if you do that, we will end up with something that looks like this. So a lot of the random things here are going to become bananas, uh, which kind of is not surprising. So uh, this is kind of a powerful idea because we can also just uh, uh, specify a particular layer and tune the input to maximize the layer's activations. Um, and this is a good way of trying to visualize what kind of features the layer is representing. Uh, and typically what happens is that if you do this with a higher layer where the rep representations are more complex, um, then you get something interesting. So there is this Google Deep Dream uh, thing that has been published in the research blog at Google where they did this, you know, they applied this idea, uh, so they trained a neural network on images of uh, animals, uh, and they then presented an image uh, of some landscape, I don't know what the original image was, and, um, and applied this uh, uh, idea of backpropagating the gradients, and when they did that, some strange patterns started to arise, like uh, the face of a dog ear, uh, a bird, uh, you know, some other object and so on, and this looks terrifying. <laughs> so it's uh, <laughs> like uh, two faces of dogs at the same time and so on. But it also produces very nice images. So there's uh, you know, people trying to do art out of these things. Um, okay, so I, I think you can do the break here. <laughs>